Welcome to Indian Omics. I'm Lata Venkatesh, and my guest today is the renowned Dr. Nouriel Roubini. Dr. Roubini needs no introduction. His prescient calls about the global financial crisis of 2008 and the more recent property crash in China are just two instances that come to the mind. But in his latest book, Mega Threats, he points to 10 threats starting from geopolitics and climate change and wars to soaring public and private debt and joblessness due to the rise of artificial intelligence that can lead to the world in the very least to a depression like in the 1930s. Well, today we have the man himself uh, to learn from and to hear about these mega threats. Dr. Rubini, thank you very much for joining us, sir. Before we get uh, to the book itself, uh, let me start with what is immediately panning out in the United States. Do you think the banking collapse is over for now or was that just a trailer and we may see more of that kind? Uh, I don't think it's over. I think there'll be more financial institutions going to be in trouble. And recently the problems of the banks have come from what is referred to as market or duration risk, meaning having long-term securities whose value is falling as interest rates are going higher, but we're going to go from market risk to credit risk because now there is a beginning of a credit crunch in the banking system, especially the regional banks that lend money to households, to corporations, to businesses, to commercial real estate. And once there's going to be a recession, then there'll be more non-performing loans, more defaults by households and businesses, and therefore there'll be more stresses for parts of the U.S banking system. Mm. But you feel pretty sure it is going to be hard landing and recession. Uh, after all, the latest jobs data uh, is indicating that unemployment is not high. Uh, the numbers are still not rising. So you think we may be able to escape without a recession at all? Well, paradoxically, the fact that the labor market is still tight, the low unemployment rate, aging of population, restriction to migration, fall in labor force participation rate implies that the wage inflation is still too high and therefore the Fed has to increase interest rates even more to achieve the 2% inflation target. But if they raise interest rates even more, there'll be two problems. One, the likelihood of a recession becomes more likely and a severe recession. Two, they will have more financial stresses, not just for banks, but for other holders of assets. And also for those who have too much debt, going to face debt servicing difficulties. And there'll be a doom loop between the economic contraction and financial stresses. So there is a contradiction between the achievement of price stability on one side, maintaining economic growth and having financial stability. Mm. And the recent stresses in the banks makes this trade off even more hard to achieve. But what if they wimp out? What if they just learn to live with a 4% inflation? Uh, would that still mean a stagflation? Or would it mean, well, you know, some kind of growth, uh, not very good, but, uh, uh, you know, we still amble along. Is not that a possibility? I think that the Fed, like most major central banks, will wimp out, gonna blink because the consequences of going back to 2% inflation will be economic and financial instability. In the short run, that may prevent a recession. In the short run, the stock market may rally. But if you blink, then there'll be a de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectation. There'll be a more severe wage price spiral. And we'll have a repeat of what happened in the 1970s, where the Fed was behind the curve. Inflation got out of control, and then we still had stagflation because of negative supply shocks. And you can postpone a debt crisis maybe by a couple of years by wiping out the real value of nominal long duration debt with unexpected inflation. But once inflation expectations move upwards, then long rates are going to be higher, short rates are going to be higher, nominal and real are going to be higher, and therefore those who have high debt ratio are going to still face eventually insolvency. So you're going to postpone the stagflation and the debt crisis, but you're not going to be able to avoid it over time. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you uh, argue that very clearly in your latest project syndicate uh, essay. 
and to uh, in the medium term in the mega threats book but before i come to that uh, uh, dr rubini what would you advise investors then as you point out uh, in your project syndicate article the 60 40 debt equity didn't work at all in uh, 2022 investors lot lost on both counts is there a place to hide now Uh, there are options um, absolutely 60 40 works only when inflation is low and therefore the correlation between equity and bond prices is negative but when inflation is rising even more gradually you get uh, that equity do poorly so the discount factor for equity long rates is higher but long rates being higher means the price of bonds is lower and therefore you lose money even on unquote the safe defensive asset is bonds What you need to do to protect yourself from inflation are several things. One is a short-term safe bonds that reprice higher with higher yields without the price impact of long duration. Inflation index bonds, gold and other precious metal that do well when there is inflation, the basement of fiat currency, but also when there is de-dollarization in the world. And also you want to go in some of the green metals. The green transition is going to imply more demand for the green metals but the supply is going to be limited by a variety of constraint finally sustainable forms of real estate may also be part of that portfolio you need the real assets that do well when inflation is moderately high and but you need to do real estate that is going to be sustainable because many real estate assets even in north america are going to be stranded because of global climate change flood hurricanes sea level rises heat waves and droughts you name it mm. so you have to think about alternatives to traditional 6040 oh yes uh, i think people are already listening to that advice we are seeing the way gold has been trending higher uh, but uh, dr rubini what about emerging markets as an alternative uh, asset class uh, at least in india and i'm sure in several other emerging markets as well we are already into positive real rates Uh, interest rate is higher than inflation would that be uh, a, a worthwhile asset class uh it depends uh, you have to distinguish between the better credits in the emerging markets and those that have high inflation twin fiscal and current account deficits and other forms of macroeconomic problem i would say that india among emerging market is a certainly a positive one uh it has a high real rates as a reasonably stable now monetary policy fighting inflation fiscal policy could be better but is okay and the structural factors for india go in the favor of india potential growth around 7% maybe higher with more economic reform a young and growing population a catch up of per capita income because it's much lower than china so india is going to be a rising power in the next few years and that is with additional economic reforms so certainly india and a few other emerging markets might be a good place to invest both for fixed income and even in the equity markets okay uh, uh, well that's good to hear at least uh, the viewership here who is listening to you right now uh, but uh, dr rubini you spoke about de-dollarization uh, that's been a real talking point especially after the sanctions against china you think that can work a non dollar medium of uh, exchange between countries well it's clear that the strategic rivals of the united states uh, china russia iran or korea pakistan and their own friends and allies want to build an alternative uh, economic monetary and global reserve currency system because they're concerned about the sanctions that the us europe and other can impose You know, the chinese have a trillion dollar of dollar reserves and therefore they're going to move in the direction of proposing the rmb as being an alternative to the us dollar and gradually of course we are going to go from a unipolar to a bipolar global reserve currency system in that system however i see india being closer to the west and to the dollar rather than being close to the rmb you know china and india are strategic rivals uh, they have uh, border issues it's true that india right now may need uh, oil energy food fertilizers from russia uh, but that dependency can change over time and i see the future of india 
uh, geopolitically being a member of the Quad, being closer to the U.S. and the West. And also, it's going to benefit from uh, French shoring. Money is going to be moving out of China because of the risk of China. It's going to move to places that are much more friendly to the West. One of them, given the industrial and tech base, is going to be India. So I assume that India is not going to be part of that de-dollarization process. Well, one point that you po point out, uh, both in the Project Syndicate article and in the uh, book Mega Threats, is the likelihood of protracted inflation, uh, given the fact that uh, you know there is French shoring and near shoring, as you point out, higher protectionism, as well as uh, you know this chase for green green inflation, as you call it. Uh, can you tell us? I mean, is this what we are? Is the period of deflation over? Is it behind us? And are we clearly leading into a medium-term inflation? Yes, we are, both for supply-side reasons and demand-side reasons. On the supply side, there are a number of uh, medium-long-term uh, stagflationary shocks and trend that reduce potential growth and increase the cost of production. They are restrictions to trade, protectionism and deglobalization, uh, reshoring and friendshoring, uh, aging of population in many countries, restriction to migration, geopolitical depression and decoupling, global climate change, pandemics, backlash against income and wealth inequality, cyber warfare, and weaponizing the dollar. On the demand side, we live in a world where there is so much private and public debt that the central banks try to raise interest rates to fight inflation that cause an economic and financial crash. There'll be structural budget deficits. We have to spend more on security to fight climate change, to fight the next pandemic, to fight uh, robotic automation and the implication for jobs, and to reduce inequality. All those things imply more government spending. that constraints how much we raise taxes. We'll have structural larger budget deficits that either crowd out growth or they cause a debt crisis or if we monetize them, we can wipe out some real value of these debt and deficits through inflation. So I fear that the path of this resistance is going to be to monetize and higher average inflation. Not very high in advanced economies, but not 2%, maybe 6% or so in advanced economies. Thank you very much, Dr. Rubini, for joining us in this conversation. Such a pleasure being with you today. Thank you.